Welcome to the worship at Westminster in our inclusive family of faith. We especially welcome our visitors and those joining us on YouTube. Occasionally, as those in the Reformed tradition highly value scripture, we attempt to hear, to speak, to reflect, to sing on a longer piece of the Bible together. So this morning we will be hearing the entirety of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, which is in found, found in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. The sermon is a wonderful collection of Jesus' teaching that tells us about how to live like God wants us to in God's kingdom. And it fits in so well with our theme this fall as we explore what exactly do disciples of Jesus Christ do? Matthew tells us that Jesus went up a mountain to preach this sermon. And so we're reminded of the other places in the Bible where people encounter God and the Word of God on mountaintops. For example, Exodus tells us that Moses received the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. First King tells us that Elijah encountered God on a mountain. So when Matthew says, Jesus went up a mountain and taught, he is saying to us, Listen carefully. What you are about to hear is important. God is speaking to you here. A scripture reading, Matthew 5, 1 through 20. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hidden. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way... Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. This is Matthew 5, verses 21 through 42. 
You're familiar with the command to the ancients, do not murder. I'm telling you that anyone who is so much as angry with a brother or sister is guilty of murder, carelessly calling a brother idiot, and you might just find yourself hauled into court. Thoughtlessly, thoughtlessly yell stupid at a sister and you are in big trouble. The simple moral fact is that words kill. This is how, this is how, this is how I want you to conduct yourself in these matters. If you enter your place of worship and about to make an offering, you suddenly remember a grudge a friend has against you. Abandon your offering. Leave it immediately. Go to this friend and make things right. Then, and only then, come back and work things out with God. Or, say you're out on the street and an old enemy accosts you. Don't lose a minute. Make the first move. Make things right with him. After all, if you leave the first move to him, knowing his track record, you're likely to end up in court, maybe even jail. If that happens, you won't get out without a stiff fine. You know the next commandment pretty well, too. Don't go to bed with another spouse. But don't think you've preserved your virtue simply by staying out of bed. Your heart can be corrupted by lust even quicker than your body. Those leering looks you think nobody notices, they also corrupt. Let's not pretend this is easier than it really is. If you want to live a morally pure life, here's what you have to do. You have to blind your right eye the moment you catch it in a lustful leer. You have to choose to live one-eyed or else be dumped on a moral trash pile. And you have to chop off your right hand the moment you notice it raised threateningly. Better a bloody stump than your entire being discarded for good in the dump. Remember the scripture that says, whoever divorces his wife, let him do it legally giving her divorce papers and her legal rights. Too many of you are using that as a cover for selfishness and whim, pretending to be righteous just because you are legal. Please, no more pretending. If you divorce your wife, you're responsible for making her an adulteress, unless she's already made herself that by sexual promiscuity. And if you marry such a divorced adulteress, you're automatically an adulterer yourself. You can't use legal cover to mask a moral failure. And don't, say, and don't say anything you don't mean. This counsel is embedded deep in our traditions. You only make things worse when you lay down a smokescreen of Pisces talk, saying, I'll pray for you, and never doing it. Saying, God be with you, and not meaning it. You don't make your words true by embellishing them with religious lace. And making your speech sound more religious, it becomes less true. Just saying yes and no. When you manipulate words to get your own way, you go wrong. Here's another old saying that deserves a second look. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Is that going to get us anywhere? Here's what I propose. Don't hit back at all. If someone strikes you, stand there and take it. If someone drags you into court and sues for the shirt off your back, gift wrap your best coat and make a present of it. And if someone takes unfair advantage of you, use the occasion to practice the servant life. No more tit for tat stuff. Live generously. <laughs>
Blessed are you who suffer hate all because of me. Rejoice and be glad, yours is the kingdom, shine for all to see. Our next scripture reading comes from Matthew 6, verses 1 through 15. And sometimes it's hard to imagine what it would have been like sitting on a mountainside listening to Jesus preach a three-chapter-long sermon. So to help us hear a couple passages from his Sermon on the Mount this morning, we'll be treated to clips from Visual Bibles movie, Matthew. So listen to the Word of God from Jesus. Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. If you do, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. (laughs) But when you give to the needy, (laughs) do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the street corners, oh, to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father, in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth, as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Join me in a responsive scripture reading. And whatever you fast, do not look dismal like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so as to show others that they are fasting. Truly I tell you, 
they have received their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that your fasting may be seen, but by your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rush consume and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust consumes and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Therefore, I tell you this, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you will wear. It is, isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And are you not of more value than they? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? And do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and thrown into the oven tomorrow, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, what will we eat, what will we drink, or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles that strive for all these things, and indeed your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. And for Matthew 7, verses 1 through 5, we'll take one more trip back to the mountainside where Jesus is teaching, this time offering words of wisdom about judging. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? <laughs> <laughs> How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye, you hypocrite. <laughs> First take the plank out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Matthew 7, verses 6 through 12. 
Do not give what is holy to dogs, and do not throw your pearls before swine, or they will trample them underfoot and turn and maul you. Ask, and it will be given you. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who searches finds, and for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for bread, will give a stone? Or if the child asks for a fish, will give a snake? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask Him? In everything, do to others as you would have them do to you. For this is the law and the prophets. Enter through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the road is easy that leads to destruction, and there are many who take it. For the gate is narrow and the road is hard that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorns or figs from thistles? In the same way, every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will know them by their fruits. Our scripture reading, Matthew 7, 21 through 29. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not pro prosper in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many deeds of power in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Go away from me, you evildoers. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on rock. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Now when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as their scribes. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. It's a little bit like drinking from a fire hose, but in the Sermon on a Mount, Jesus paints a picture of the way it is in God's kingdom. The poor, the peacemakers, and the persecuted are blessed. We should be the flavor of life and shine our light, loving enemies and friends alike. We should keep our promises, living generously and graciously, not storing up treasures here. He tells us how to fast and pray, not to judge or worry. We should ask, seek, and knock as we enter the narrow gate, bearing good fruit and building our house on a solid foundation. What a challenging and beautiful vision he cast. Could it be any more plain what Jesus wants his disciples to do? Jesus tells us quite clearly, but that doesn't always make it easy. As Dr. Richard Beaton, professor at Fuller Theological Seminary, puts it in his commentary, to be a follower of Jesus means that behaviors and actions, the manner in which we live out our daily lives, are the artifacts of the inner life of faith. Jesus makes it plain how our lives should reflect our inner faith in God's kingdom calm. But how often do we idolize the rich, the violence, and the persecutors? How often do we hide our light afraid of what others might think? How often do we barely have the energy to love our friends, much less our enemies? 
How often do we break our promises living in an economy of scarcity? How often do we judge and worry instead of fasting and praying? How often do we forget to ask or refuse to seek or ignore the door? How often do we build a house of sand, doing what is easy in the moment rather than committing to a long-term future? Jesus doesn't mince words, using imperative after imperative to try and drive his point home. He lays out the surprising figures who are central to God's kingdom, that is, who we are, and then what we should do, how to treat ourselves and others, as well as how to love God. But rather than trying to give us an impossible to-do list, he is instead inviting us into a new worldview, into a community shaped by the margins coming to the center, a community shaped by faithfulness, generosity, and grace, a community that seeks to love God and love our neighbors as ourselves. The Sermon on the Mount is more than a sum of its parts. It's envisioning the kingdom of God here on earth with us as partners in that kingdom work. This sermon is a call to set aside instincts or the way the broken world has always worked and to dream something new. The ending metaphor calls us to build our houses on the words of Jesus Christ, our great teacher, our rock and our redeemer. It reminds us that discipleship, what disciples do, isn't an overnight accomplishment. It takes time to build our house piece by piece on the solid foundation of Jesus Christ. Every time we listen to God's blessed ones or refuse to judge or work on taking that plank out of our own eye or pray as Jesus taught us or ask, seek, and knock, we add a brick to the house. Piece by piece, we put together a sanctuary, a home built on the words and ways of Jesus Christ that can withstand the storms of life. Piece by piece, together at Westminster, we put together a sanctuary, a home built on the words and ways of Jesus Christ in which all can find a place to belong. I want you to consider, out of the three chapters we heard this morning, which piece of Jesus' will you claim as your own? Which piece are you going to work on? Reread it again at home this week, or maybe you already heard one that resonated with you. Write it on a post-it note and put it on your mirror or your fridge or your steering wheel somewhere where you will see it every day. Which one will you embrace for, let's say, this season of fall and try to live it out? For that's what disciples do piece by piece, day by day, moment by moment. We try to live out Jesus' teaching. Piece by piece, we create a new world order by realizing God's kingdom, new ways of relating to each other, new ways of building a life together. As the hymn says, let us build a house where all are named, their songs and visions heard and loved and treasured, taught and claimed as words within the word, built of tears and cries and laughter, prayers of faith and songs of grace. Let this house proclaim from floor to rafter, all are welcome in this place. So let's get to building on our solid rock foundation, for that is what disciples do. Amen.